Ma'asechet Kedushin, Daf Nun Vav. The first topic today is misusing Ma'aser Sheni money. If someone has Ma'aser Sheni, a best thing is to take that very produce itself and bring it to Yerushalayim, and he can eat it in Yerushalayim and share it with everyone. It's beautiful halacha to take a tenth of all of one's produce, and let's say you're coming for um, uh, for Sukkot, which is seven days and or eight days, and now you're going to be uh, consuming a tenth of your entire produce in eight days well that's a lot and you probably won't be able to eat it yourself which is good that means you're gonna to have to share it with friends and family and poor people and Levi'im and make it very festive and show one's gratitude and also elevate the economy and glory of Yerushalayim so that's the goal if uh, if it's too far or too hard to carry all that produce then one can redeem it with money and bring the money to Yerushalayim, buy food in Yerushalayim, and then do the same thing. Now we learn, One should not buy an animal outside of Yerushalayim using money of Maaser Sheni. You're supposed to go into Yerushalayim and find the marketplace there. And then there buy fruits, vegetables, animals. But if you're going to buy it outside Yerushalayim and then bring it in, this is not appropriate. One, because maybe you'll eat it outside of Yerushalayim. Two, because maybe it will diminish on its way while it's walking. And so uh, you also want to bolster the economy of the sellers in Yerushalayim. So therefore, one should not do that. Bidi Avad. One did redeem his Maaser Sheni for money. And then he got closer to Yerushalayim, but still outside Yerushalayim, he buys an animal if he did it by mistake meaning he didn't realize that this money is maaser sheni money and he bought the animal so then then the money returns to his place in other words this was an erroneous transaction i thought this was regular money i was just going to eat this for a barbecue over here and now i realize the maaser sheni money i never would have made this uh, sale um so we return the sale uh the that's the the buyer would not have uh, bought it uh, the seller also might say, I didn't, uh, I don't want this Maaser Shani money. What am I going to do with it? I have to bring it to Yerushalayim. And so the sale is void in both directions. Um, if one did it on purpose, he knew it was Maaser Shani money and says, yeah, I want to get this as nice animal over here, better prices. Um, and so then, uh, it is, uh, the, the animal is Maase, is, is a Maase Shani animal now. And you should bring it to Yerushalayim and eat it there. Bamakom, bamakom eat it in Yerushalayim. You can't say the sale is void because he knew what he was doing. So the sale is valid, but make sure to bring in Yerushalayim. And don't do that again next time, right? You really should buy it in Israel, in, in Yerushalayim. Amar Rabbi Yehuda, that's Tanakama. Rabbi Yehuda says, B'amed ibn Mamurim mitkaven la velakach techila l'shem shelamim. Ava mitkaven l'osi ma'ot ma'asir sheni l'cholin ben shogeg ben mezid yachziru damim limkom ham. says, when do we say that b'di avad, just bring it to Yerushalayim and eat it? That's when you had in mind, the buyer had in mind, that he's going to take this animal and make it a shelamim. Uh, people would do that often because it's a holiday and it's nice to bring shelamim. Shelamim, only part of it goes onto the Mizbeach, but most of it, the owners eat, the Kohanim get some, the owners eat most of it. So it's a nice way of having um, a nice barbecue and inviting everyone. It, but it's also, um, uh, um, also you elevate it to sacrificial meat, Kadashim Kalim, that anyone can eat any, in, in uh, Yerushalayim, who's Tahor. Okay, so uh, often, and this is the proper thing to do, is with Maaseh Shani money, buy an animal and make it Shalamim. If the person had that in mind, that's going to be a Shalamim. And, uh, but they, they uh, uh, violated by buying it outside Yerushalayim. Okay, but still it's going to be a Shalamim. So then now we're sure that it's going to be treated respectfully and it will be brought in Yerushalayim. There's no problem. It's not going to eat it outside Yerushalayim because it's a Shalamim and you can't eat it outside anyway. However, if he ha- if his uh, uh, if he has in mind that he is going to uh, redeem this money, meaning the holiness of the money is going to leave and go into the animal, um, uh, uh, and so now the Maseshani money is now not sacred anymore, and he's not going to treat this animal like a shelamim offering, um, but he's going to uh, treat it just like a regular animal, then this is a problem, and whether he did it uh, by mistake or on purpose, of, before we said, if it's bishogeg, then the sale is valid. Now we're adding that even if it's on, on purpose, 
um, if he's not going to treat the animal, what did not have in mind to treat the animal as a shalamim, then the money should be returned. The sale is invalid. Um, so the idea is two reasons. Number one, the buyer, he's not going to treat this properly. Maybe he's going to eat it outside. And second, maybe since he's since the the holiness did not go necessarily go into the animal if it goes to shalamim if it makes a shalamim the holiness certainly transferred to the animal but if not he didn't make a shalamim maybe the the holiness is still in the money and therefore the uh, seller the the seller is going to be like i don't what am i going to do with this money and he might not treat it properly um, and bring it to Yerushalayim. And so therefore the sale is void. That is Rabbi Yudah's opinion. Now, Hold on. How could Rabbi Yudah seems to be contradicting himself? Because up in our Mishnah, it says that someone takes a Hekdesh money and does Kiddushin with it, and he did it on purpose. The Kiddushin is valid, right? It's a good transaction. And yet here, he says the the, the sale is, is invalid. And these are equivalent because just like in Kiddushin, you're not making a shalamim or anything. You're just giving her the money. It's a it's a it's a monetary transaction. He has to have money and gives it to her, and then there thereby the kiddushin um, is is effectuated. And there he says it is effectuated. Um, and then she'll go and te- it's maser shini money, and she'll go and have to spend that money in Yerushalayim. And so in our Mishnah here in Kiddushin, the Buddha said that's fine. The transaction is fine. How come we don't do the same thing in this case where the guy buys an animal? He's not. He doesn't have in mind it's going to be a shalamim, just a regular animal. Why don't we say that the, it's a good sale, and then the seller will have to take this maser shini money and. Um, go and take it to Yerushalayim and spend it there. Uh, Rabbi Elazar explains the case of the woman is different because a woman knows that a ma- money of Maser Shani do not become desacralized by it being transferred to her by doing Kiddushin. It does not become desacralized. So she knows this is Maser Shani money. He told her that it is, and so she knows that, and she accepts, and she will go and take it to Yerushalayim, although she can't get benefit from this money right where she is, um, outside of Yerushalayim, but she'll she'll take it there, and she doesn't mind, so she'll be careful, and sh- she will do that. Whereas a seller will not be careful, because most of the time, people buy things from a from a seller with regular money, and then the seller goes, and it's his... It's his uh, the seller is his money, and he does that's his profit. Or if the seller is in Yerushalayim and he takes maaseh sheni money, that's also fine because then it becomes desacralized by doing that transaction. So sellers are not going to be careful to treat it like maaseh money, whereas a woman who receives it for kiddushin will, and that accounts for the biyudas differing opinions in each case. Matkif la rabbi Yirmiya. Yirmiya, however, challenges this with another case of Mishnah and Maser, Masechet Maser Sheni. Vare behema teme'a avadim v'karkaot. Adam yodeh she'en me'ot Maser Sheni mitchalin alehen. Someone goes and takes Maser Sheni money and he buys uh, either a non-kosher animal, slaves, land. You're not allowed to use Maser Sheni money to buy these things. And if a person did, um, so since everyone knows that you can't use Maser Sheni money for such a thing, so it remains holy. It does not become unsacred through the sale, right? You can give the money and then take that thing, but that money is still uh, sacred. Um, uh, now, Utnan, En lochim behemat me'a avadim v'karkaot b'mot maser sheni afil b'yerushalayim v'im lakach yochal k'negdan. And so here is the Mishnah that says one is not permitted to buy these things that cannot be used as food um, and you can't with Maser Shani money. You can't even buy it in Yerushalayim, uh, even though yeah, you're 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 spending the money in Yerushalayim, but it has to be spent on food. Now, if you did bedi avad, let's say you did, then the uh, buyer, right, the one who had the who was it was his Maser Shani money to begin with, he has to go get other money. That's equivalent to it. So if he had a thousand dollars of Maser Shem and Sheni money, and he brings it to Yerushalayim or anywhere, and he buys some land with it, this was an improper use of Maser Shani money. So we say the sale, uh, we leave the sale, the sale is valid. 
um, and that money it remains in the hands of the seller, but the buyer is responsible to go get another thousand dollars and use that to transfer the kiddushah that was in the money that's in the hands of the seller and transfer that to this new money that he gets. And then this is now new ma'asir shini money that he has to go spend on food in Yerushalayim. So the question is, why is there a difference? How come in the case of a woman, we say that the kiddushin is valid, and the woman she goes and spends the she'll go and spend the money in Yerushalayim, and we don't say that the husband has to go take other money and redeem the money that's in the hands of the woman, and then he has to go. All right? Why don't we say it's the same thing as in this case where the buyer has to go get new money and redeem the money that he gave to the seller. In both cases, he's using Masir Shani, not for food items, um, so it should be the same law. Uh, so we answer, In fact, this case here of the, the, the our, our Mishnah Kiddushin um, that says it's valid according to the Buddha, is uh, regarding a woman who's a chavera. Chavera or chaverim are people that are meticulous in uh, laws of, uh, uh, in, in, in the various laws, um, especially regarding tirumot and ma'asrat. This is a ma'aser law. So they're gonna, she's going to be very careful. She knows, oh, this is ma'aser ma'ashani money. I have to t- treat it uh, uh, carefully. I'm only going to eat it in Yerushalayim. She, since she is a chavera and she knows, that's why the husband uh, doesn't have to worry about it and doesn't have to go and take other money. Whereas, in this case of Masechet Mishnah Masechet Sheni, we're talking about a seller, a regular seller, who's not a chaver, and uh, he's not gonna, he's gonna say, well, I just uh, sold an item, and uh, so the money's mine. He's not going to be careful with the Masechet Sheni, and therefore, the buyer has to go and take other money to make it, un- uh, to redeem that money, and so that the Masechet Sheni holiness will be properly properly transferred. Good. Amar mor im lakach yochal kenegdan. We now requote the section from the Mishnah from in Maaseh Shani that said if someone went, took a Maaseh Shani money and he bought land with it, which is inappropriate, um, then the sale is valid, but the buyer has to go get other money and use that for Maaseh Shani. Ve'amai yachziru damav komam ki hatam. Why should that be so? Why don't we say this is the same as the person who buys an animal outside of Yerushalayim with Maser money, where we say that the sale is invalid and the, you have to go get the money goes back. The money that was in the hands of the seller goes back to the buyer and that animal goes back to the seller. Why don't we invalidate it? How come it's a different law? Amar Shemuel says, you're right. Really, the sale should be go back. That is the basic law. Um, but in the, that Mishnah, uh, when he buys land, is talking about when the seller is gone. He ran away. We can't find him, and so that's why we can't uh, take we can't take back the money and and uh, invalidate the sale because uh, he's not around anymore. But otherwise, you're right. It should. So really, both cases, if you can, you should invalidate the sale and the money goes back to the buyer. Now, okay, so now we understand that the only reason that you don't undo the sales because he ran away. But if he would be around, then we would tell the seller um, that you have to, you're penalized. You have to give back the money. It's bad for the seller because he made a good sale. You know, we assume that he made a profit on it. So he doesn't want to give the money back and take the um, land or the animal back. Um, so he is getting the a brunt of the fine that the money is being taken away from him. Why are we doing that? Why not give the brunt of the fine on the buyer and make him go get, say that the sale is valid, the seller keeps the money, and the buyer has to go get other money and use it to redeem the money that he used improperly. Why not say, he's isn't, isn't the lokeach, the buyer, the one primarily responsible, was his ma'asir money, and he used it for the wrong purpose. And we answer, uh, No, in fact, the mouse is not responsible for stealing the cheese, but rather the hole is responsible for, steal- for stealing the cheese. Now, I think most of us would think the opposite, that the mouse is responsible. But the point of the Gemara is that the mouse, if he has no hole to hide it in, he wouldn't bother stealing it. But rather, it's the opportunity that's created by there being a hole in the wall that allows the mouse to go ahead and steal the cheese. And therefore here too, the even though it's the seller, sorry, the buyer that actually had the Maseshani money and misused it, 
but the seller made it possible for him to do so. And he's kind of like, uh, he's uh, opened the stumbling block and said, oh, this is my session money. I don't care. I'll take it. And here is, uh, here is the land or here is this animal that I'm selling you outside of Yerushalayim. And so the seller uh, is responsible because he created the opportunity. It's kind of like, uh, you know, if you buy stolen goods, who's responsible? The thief that stole them in the first place or you, the buyer, well, you, by accepting, <laughs> buying stolen goods from him, you're opening a market for him to do that. And so it's not, we don't blame the thief, but we blame the enabler. Um, I guess there's always going to be mice, but you have to, you know, if you want to get rid of mice, plug up the holes. Um, it might be more effective than actually getting rid of the mice. Okay, so therefore, yes, the seller is the one that should be penalized. Now we ask, the other way around, but if there was no mouse, then the hole wouldn't do anything. The hole is just a hole. Isn't really the mouse responsible? Even if there were sellers that would be open to selling things from our selling land from our Sesheni money, but they wouldn't sin without the... Uh, without the buyer coming and offering it. So why don't we blame the buyer more? Uh, so we answer that it makes sense that wherever the money is, that's where the fine should be. Where is this Maas money that was used inappropriately? Well, the buyer gave it to the seller. So now this is in the seller's hands. So now if we want to give a penalty, how we go? We give a penalty to the buyer to go get other money? Okay, if you can't find the seller, then that's exa exactly what we do if he ran away. But otherwise, if we, if we know where he is, well, where is the money? It's in the hands of the seller, so therefore the penalty should be in his hands that he has to return that money. That brings us to the next Mishnah of someone trying to do Kiddushin with an item that is Asur Behana'a. There's various prohibitions in the Torah that not only you're not allowed to eat it, but you're also not allowed to derive any benefit. If you can't derive any benefit, you can't sell it, you can't give it as a gift, which means it has no monetary value. And so Kiddushin has to have at least the worth of Peruta. So here's the case. It's a Mekadesh Be'orla. Someone takes a fruit from a tree in his first three years of growth, prohibited by Hana'ah, Bekele HaKedem. Some grapes and uh, grains that were grown together is a subhana'a. Shor haniskal, if someone owns an ox and the ox goes and kills someone, then the ox is put on trial. And if it's guilty, then if, I mean, that in fact it did that, then it gets stoned and you cannot get any benefit from the meat, the skin, any part of that ox. If there's a um, unsolved murder, uh, we uh, we do the the take a, take a heifer and break its neck and the body of the animal. You cannot get any benefit from it. Si porem mesora mesora. When it becomes purified, you get two birds and one you kill and you dip the other one, the live one, in the in the blood of the other one. And uh, it seems here from this Mishnah that both birds you're not allowed to have benefit from. Bisaar nazir. When nazir finishes his ceremony, uh, he part of it is he cuts his hair and that hair is holy and you can't get benefit from it. Peter Hamor, firstborn of a Hamor, before you redeem it, all cannot get benefit. Basab Halab, this is the most relevant one, uh, meat and milk. Not only are you not allowed to uh, cook it and eat it, you can even get benefit from it, which means you will not be allowed to, you know, buy a, a cheeseburger and give it as a gift to a non-Jew, although the non-Jew can eat it. You cannot get benefit from it. Vechulin shenish hatu ba'azara, or a regular animal that you do shechita in the Bet HaMikdash is not allowed. And all these things um, are prohibited. So if, you, if someone takes any of these items and gives it to a woman for Kiddushin, the Kiddushin is invalid because all these things have zero value. However, if a person takes any of these items and sells it to someone else, now technically, since it has no value, so what? How could the sale be valid? You can't just sell someone that has something that has no value. So it could be that you sell it either to a non-Jew for whom it has value, or to a Jew who doesn't care about it and is going to benefit from it anyway. And for that person, it has value, although it's prohibited to do so. It's prohibited to sell it. But if someone agrees to give you money and for him that person is valuable, then the sale is valid. In other words, that person gave you money, and so it's your money. And so if this uh, person who received the money goes, goes and does Kiddushin with that money, the Kiddushin is valid. You can't do so to begin with. The, that money has, has, is transferred 
and therefore the Kiddushin is valid. Okay, Gemara is going to ask about these items. How do you know that fruit from a tree in this first three years is prohibited not only to eat, but also to benefit from the Tanya? Well, the Pasuk says that this is forbidden, you can't eat it. That From that I know um, eating. How do you know I can't benefit from it, make dyes out of it, um, make oil out of it, and use it to burn a candle, uh, a lamp rather. From the extra words, and it is forbidden totally, double language, so that comes to include all things, let a kulam. Okay, that's how we know that case. How do you know that mixed kinds are prohibited when uh, they're in a vineyard? Amar amar kera pen tigdash pen tukad esh. The pasuk says, uh, don't uh, put in your vineyard other seeds because it will become tigdash. A, cu- a curious word. Sounds like it'll become holy. So it doesn't actually become holy. So what does this mean? Chiz- we're going to see two opinions. Chizkiah says this uh, tigdash is a concatenation of two words. Words, that tukad esh, um, that if you do this, it will have to be burnt in fire, and you can't even benefit from that fire. So the only thing that you could do with it, you can't eat it, you can't benefit from it, you just have to burn it and destroy it. So that's pen t- tukad esh. I guess a more Peshat way is that it'll become like consecrated. Not that it's actually consecrated, but just like something that's consecrated. You cannot eat it, use it, yeah, right? It's holy. You can't have derived benefit from it. So too, kilayim, uh, also you cannot, be, uh, it says pentikdash, it'll be like something hektish. We challenge Rav Hashem because it, we're going, when something is uh, becomes Kodesh, you can redeem it with money. And then the item is no longer holy. as uh, If you'll say Kedushat Adamim. Um, so then the money, the tra- the uh, holiness transfers to the money. Would you say that Kilayim, you could do the same thing? If I have $100 worth of, uh, of grapes that grew in a Kilayim vineyard, can I go and, re- and uh, redeem it with money? And then the grapes become permitted and the uh, holiness goes into the money? You cannot do that, right? That's in general, you cannot redeem Kileha Kedem. It's not like Ektesh. We can prove it from our very Mishnah because our Mishnah said, if someone takes Kila Kerem, any of the items on the list, including Kila Kerem, and sells it, you can use the money with Kiddushin. Now, if the if the holiness would transfer from the Kila Kerem to the money, then the money would become prohibited and you would not be able to do Kiddushin with the money. You see from the Mishnah itself that the uh, selling it does not actually transfer anything, that those, the, those uh, grapes remain prohibited forever no matter what. And uh, the money that you uh, uh, got is just regular money, and that's why the Kiddushin works with that money, assuming that the buyer uh, willingly gave over this money uh, to the seller. So now the seller, it's his money, and he can do Kiddushin with it. So you see Rav uh derivation, explanation of the word pentikdash, that it becomes like consecrated property, is not accurate, because it would lead to the conclusion that you could redeem it, but you can't redeem Kila Kedem. So rather, we uh, prefer the derivation of Chizkiah that you have to destroy it. And the last case for today, Shor HaNiskal, how do you know that an ox that was a, a sentenced to death by stoning is prohibited in uh, deriving benefit? Look at the Pasuk here. It says, uh, an ox kills a man or a woman. Um, so, number one, the shor you have to stone. And you can't eat its flesh. Now, isn't that obvious you can't eat its flesh? If, if, some, if an animal is stoned, any animal that, that dies without proper shechita, you're not allowed to eat. It's a nevela. So, this is an extra phrase. Uh, so uh, why say it? Um, so that's to teach, uh, right? Um, uh, so why why say don't do not eat it? Okay, from this itself, we're not yet going to learn that Rather, from this from this phrase, we learn that let's say 
uh, was slaughtered before it got stoned, right? This ox is sitting there in court in the defendant's chair, all, you know, uh, acting, trying to act all, all innocent. And the judge says, oh, you're guilty. You have to be stoned. Now, before they actually take it out to be stoned, a butcher comes, runs up, and does proper shechita on it. So you might think that, well, it's an animal's kosher because it got shechita. That's why the pasuk has to add, yes, uh, you should do sikila. If you did shechita before you got a chance to do sikila, you still can't eat the animal. Okay, so far we know that you definitely can't eat it. Behind the Aminine, how do you know that you can't derive benefit from it? Tamudomar, Ubala Shor Naki, my Mashma Shimon Ben Zoma Omer, Kadam Shomer Chabero, Yasapelona Naki, Menechasav, Ben Lo Bahem Hana Akelum. We're going to learn that from the end of the Pasuk that says, the owner of the ox is clean. Now, the Peshat, Peshat reading of this is that. He, the owner of the ox has no punishment uh, because he didn't do it himself. He didn't go kill someone and he didn't direct his ox to kill someone. It was an accident and it was done indirectly. The ox went on his own. Uh, so therefore the, um, the ox gets killed, but the owner is free from blame, free from punishment. This is in contrast to the next part where that we talk about a short mu'ad that already killed someone uh, once, twice, three times, and now the owner is not watching it. Um, so then the owner has to die. Uh, he can pay a, a ransom for his life um, that will be assessed. So this is a contrast. Anyway, that's the simple the simple reading of the Pasuk, but we're reading it differently. Bala Shonaki means he's cleaned out. Um, as Rabbi Ben Zoma says, when the person says, this, per- this person was left clear of his property, right? He has nothing else. He has nothing left. Um, so to here, there's no benefit at all. This ox that he had, this ox went and killed someone. The ox is, is stoned and is gone. The owner can't go and benefit from its skin, from its flesh, from any part of it. He's cleaned out. So that's how we learn that you can get no benefit from the ox. Now to go back a step, how do you know that that phrase, do not eat its flesh, is talking about a case where a butcher ran up and did shechita before, after it was sentenced, but before it actually got stoned. Maybe, in fact, if a, a butcher came and did proper shechita at that point after it was sentenced before it was, before it was uh, stoned, maybe it would be uh, permissible and maybe you could eat it. I mean, this is a proper shechita of an ox, so uh, ox meat is kosher. And so I might, maybe it would be kosher. And this phrase, lo yachel, um, is talking about applying to a case where it was, in fact, stoned. And now you asked, why do we need that? Since it got sikila, I know that it's not kosher. Well, maybe I, I would use this phrase, lo yachel, for what Rabbi Abhu says, Abhu, El Azar, Lo Lo Rabbi Abhu says, any time, uh, any pasuk says, do not, it shall not be eaten, you do not eat, you plural do not eat, that implies both prohibition to eat and a prohibition to get benefit from it. Unless the Pasuk says otherwise, like it says otherwise regarding a nevela, a nevela, an animal that's, um, that dies on its own. There, the, the Pasuk says, don't eat it, but you can give it to a, a, a non-Jew. You can give it to a foreigner. You can give it to a, uh, uh, to a dog. So there it goes out of its way to say you can get benefit from it. And that means that if it didn't say that, I would not be able to get benefit from it. So therefore, anytime it says do not eat, and it doesn't add anything else, um, I can assume that 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 means that you cannot get um, a, a benefit from it. Therefore, in this, according to this reading, you could read as follows, Sakol Yisakel HaShod, you're supposed to stone it. Now, and do not eat is coming to add, do not get benefit from it, right? Well, that would leave a Shod HaNaki um, open. We're going to get to that in a minute, what, what this reading would do with that extra phrase, Bala Shod HaNaki. But according to this reading, if it's stoned, well, certainly you can't eat it, 
because it's, uh, because it was stoned. And so Yidlo Yachel is coming to say, not only can you not eat it, also you cannot get benefit from it. If someone would go and do Shechita before it gets stoned, yeah, then it would be kosher. Um, so according to this reading, we can derive la, the Sur Hana'a from Lo Ye'achel. Hanimi lehecha de nafka lan isur achila mi lo ye'achel. Hacha isur achila mi sako yisekel nafka. But we reject this reading, at least for the time being. Um, and because you can only say to be Abhu's principle if the prohibition against eating is derived from the words lo yachel, then you could say lo yachel means eating and and benefit unless it says you can give it to a, a non-Jew. Um, but here we learn the prohibition against eating from sakoli sakel from the fact that it's stoned and that's why you can't eat it because in fact if someone would do shechita before it gets stoned it would be the edible. So therefore, you cannot expand lo yachel here to mean isur hana'ah because we don't derive the prohibition of eating from this word lo yachel. Rather, it must be that lo yachel is teaching us the, what we said, but said before that if you, even if you do shechita on it, it's prohibited. Um, after all, if the if this phrase lo yachel was coming to teach us only isur hana'ah, then it should have said, don't get benefit lo yehane, don't get benefit from it. Right? That would make more sense because I learned the prohibition that you can't eat it from. So I already know that. So what do you want to add? That's prohibited from benefit? So then say, oh, also you can't benefit from it. That would be a more straightforward way. I understand in other cases where you're packing everything into one phrase, lo yachel, and you don't say any uh, any exception that you can give it to a non-Jew, then lo yachel means don't eat it and don't get benefit from it. But here, uh, the prohibition of eating is from, from sakol yisakel. All you're adding is a, a prohibition of benefit. So just say, only a prohibition of benefit. So therefore, uh, we reject that reading. In that's fine. If it said, uh, I would even, uh, uh, let's say a different, re- a different reason why we, we are rejecting it to be Abu's application here. If it said, fine, I would agree with uh, your reading. Uh, you have to stone it and do not eat it and do not have benefit from it. But from the fact that the Pasuk adds its flesh, what does that mean? The phrase its flesh comes to teach that even if you did Shechita before, it got, uh, it, it, you did Sikila on it, still, right, you did Shechita, like you would, regular flesh that you eat, still it's prohibited. So the, if it had just said, Lo Yachel, fine, I might read like Rabbi Abhu, but the fact that it adds, Et Besado, comes to teach me this extra law, that, a shor, that is condemned to death by Sikila, even if you do Shechita, it's still prohibited from eating. And uh, therefore, you can only derive a law from eating here, and so the prohibition against Hana'a must come from the end of the pasuk um, uh, that he is naki. Matkif la morzutra. Now a challenge to that answer. Uh, maybe the prohibition to eat it, even though you did proper shechita, is only when you slaughter it with a stone. You're allowed to use a sharp stone to uh, to do proper slaughter. You can do that. Uh, so when you check the stone and it's nice and sharp and smooth, and you did shechita, there it kind of is similar to sik- to sikila because you're killing it with a stone. Although not by throwing the stone at it, by, by slitting its throat with a stone, but I might say, since you're using a stone, it's similar to Sikila, and that's the only case where the flesh would be prohibited to eat. Aval uh, la. But maybe but if I slaughtered it with a knife, that's totally different from... Um, from Sikila, and maybe uh, the meat would be permitted to eat in such a case. Uh, so we uh, challenge, we say, no, that doesn't make sense. Does the Torah ever say that you do Shechita with a knife? It doesn't say with a knife, it just says do, do shechita. So there's no, you can't make a distinction between doing shechita with a knife or with anything else. And if you don't lie, if you don't accept the proof from the, from the lack of the Torah saying a word, a proof, a, a evidence from absence, then I'll give you a better proof. Um, from a braita that you can says explicitly you could do shechita with anything with a stone with sharp glass with a sharp stalk of a reed and certainly with a knife um, it makes no difference you can use all these things so that you it's impossible to make a distinction and say if you do shechita with this item 
is permitted, the flesh is permitted, but with a different item is prohibited. No, shechita, shechita, shechita. And therefore, um, if the Torah is coming and saying, don't eat its flesh, its flesh means with, um, it doesn't, you can't eat the flesh if you do shechita, whether you do sekila or shechita, it doesn't matter how you do the shechita with a stone or with a knife. Good. Now, even though we saw reasons to reject the Biyabhu, if we do go back to the Biyabhu and accept it, and therefore that we say, Biyabhu taught that whenever it says, Lo yachel, lo tochel, it means um, that it's permitted for eating and hana'a, unless it says otherwise that you can give it to a dog, which it doesn't say here. So according to that principle, if you can use one, that phrase for Isur Achila and Isur Hana'a, Hai Ba'al Ashur Naki Lemayata, then what do I need the end of the phrase for the other opinion that they said we learn from Lo Yachel, that if you do Shechita before Sikila is prohibited, fine, then I need a Ba'al Ashur Naki to teach me Isur Hana'a. But according to this reading that Lo Yachel teaches me Ba'ich Achila and Hana'a, then what am I going to do with that extra phrase? And the answer is, That's to prohibit even the skin. Because I might think, since it says, don't eat, fine. Don't eat means, don't eat or get benefit. But the Pasuk added the words flesh. So I might think that only the flesh is prohibited from eating and, and getting benefit from it. But maybe the skin is permitted to get benefit from it. I can make a coat out of it. I can make a carpet out of it. And so that's why, um, we still need the phrase Baal Ashur Naki. He's cleaned out. He gets no benefit. Now there's another Tana that says Baal Ashur Naki is necessary to say he doesn't have to pay anything. This is more closer to the Peshat of the Pasuk that he doesn't have to pay anything else, meaning he doesn't have to pay half a kofed. You see, if it's mu'ad, then he gets a, the the um, the owner of the ox gets a death penalty if he can pay a ransom. Fine, but usually when it comes to damages, a short time, he still has to pay half. So you might think over here that this a short time that killed someone, maybe he has to pay half of his kofed, of his ransom. Or if it kills a pregnant woman who, had, who was uh, with child and causes a miscarriage, maybe he'd have to pay for the miscarriage, which is true for people. If a person injures someone else, like the bystander when men are fighting, they do have to pay for the miscarriage. So there's another Tanah that says, I need the phrase Baal Ashur Naki to teach me that although I would have expected that a person with a short time should pay half kofed or pay for the uh, for the for the a miscarriage. No, Baal Shonaki teaches me that you don't have to pay anything. So now I'm already I'm using Baal Shonaki for that. So how does how would this Tana learn that Hanat Oromina'lehu that you can't get any benefit from the ox hide? Me et besado from the extra word et et hatafeli besado that which is secondary to the meat. The skin is less important secondary to the meat. So so from the extra word et. Good. The idach. And now the other Tana who didn't need Baal Ashur Naki for the Chasiko and Meveladot, but used Baal Ashur Naki for, uh, uh, the, to teach that, that the skin is not allowed. What does he need the word et for? So he says et, la dadi. She's not, he doesn't derive laws from the word et. And that is a whole opinion that uh, there's a big machok, whether you derive laws from the extra word et or it's not an extra word. It's simply a, a particle that indicates a direct object, but you, you need it just for basic grammar. A famous b'raita about either Shimon and Nechemiah, the Amsonite, that went through every et in the entire Torah, assuming that, yes, we do learn things from it, and derived an extra law from every single et. But then he got this pasuk in Devarim. It says, you should uh, fear God. Now, what's et going to come to add? What, what else can be uh, equivalent that you'd add to fear of God? Fear of God is the highest thing. What, what else can you possibly add to such a thing? And so, 
he he gave up on his project. So the, so the student said, Rabbi, you've been spending years, you know, going through every single et. Look at all the work you did. What about all those all those things that you derived? What are you going to do with all that work that you fin- that you completed? Very very important principle. Just like I got merit for the seeking and and deriving laws from the, all those et, so too I I will receive reward. Board, um, on for uh, with withdrawing and realizing that my theory was mistaken. This is a really important principle. A lot of times, a person has uh, some theory or something that they're pursuing, and they put so much time and effort into proving it that they can't get away from it. Even when there's evidence against it, they'll just uh, make up all kinds of crazy things because they have. They are so invested in the theory that they've been working on and that they already put so much time and effort into it. But if someone who's intellectually honest, when you see a roadblock and you, and it, well, if you can get past it, you know, if you can solve it, fine. But if you can solve it and it's clear that your theory is wrong, then there's just as much value as realizing that, yeah, I put 10 years of work into a theory that's wrong, but now recognizing that it's wrong, that itself is praiseworthy to uh, to recognize that. And so, yeah, sometimes uh, when you're investigating something, um, you go down the dead end, but that's important also to realize the dead end and be honest and say so. And then um, you could leave that theory and, uh, and declare that I was wrong to begin with. So that's a very, very important lesson. However, he didn't have to give up so quickly. Not so quickly. He didn't have to give up uh, totally. came after and said, "Wait a second! You did a lot of good work with all those ets, and you got stuck on this one. I have a solution. What? How? What else can you add to?" Fear of Hashem that comes to include Tamidei Chachamim. Tamidei Chachamim, they they uh, are are ones uh, bridge to to in order to fear God. Is how, how do you, how do you come to fear God? So you emulate emulate the way Tamidei Chachamim. You see the, how they have Yirat Shamayim, and through Yirah of Tamidei Chachamim, that brings someone to Yirat Shamayim. And therefore, yes, it is appropriate to add uh, the word Et to include that one should not only fear Hashem, but also one should fear Tamidei Chachamim as representatives of Hashem's will and his uh, and his Torah teaching in the world. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.